Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming, many of you again. This is our second meeting of what we call the Brain Circle Home Edition. As uh, I said last time, if you were there, we were planning to meet you all in Stockholm, but this didn't work due to the corona, so we are doing our home edition from Jerusalem. This time uh, we have a very dense uh, program, uh, so we shall start without ado, and later on I'll explain uh, what, what is going to happen. Please remember that you can ask me questions, chats, so I can respond to you and ask questions uh, the speakers. Our first speaker today is our friend, our colleague from computer science uh, at the Hebrew University, Professor Amnon Shashua. Uh, Amnon Shashua was, uh, is at the computer science, studied uh, originally uh, at uh, his PhD in MIT, uh, brain and cognition, so he's connected to the brain. And in 1999, he established, founded the Mobili. I'm sure all of you know about Mobili. He is now a uh, director the, uh, of Mobili, the president of Mobili, and also of Orcam, which is another startup, a wonderful startup uh, for the aid of, uh, of people with, uh, with vision difficulties. Uh, Amnon is, uh, did not give up his research, and, and for me it's extremely important. I just looked at his publication this year. So you may know that among the all other things that he's doing, the Mobili, the Orcam, uh, Intel, and all this presidency, he's still absolutely a scientist. He published more than 20 publications this year, uh, both in patents and uh, also uh, in computer vision, machine learning, which is his field. Uh, thank you very much, Amnon, for coming. I know how busy you are. We will have with Amnon 30 minutes. 20, he will talk, 10, hopefully you will ask questions and we can interact with Amnon. So Amnon, uh, your s the stage is yours. Welcome. So uh, I, I, I thought to give kind of a, um, a bird's eye view of the past uh, few years uh, of the research we have been doing in, in my lab, a few number of uh, PhD students and, and master students, uh, looking at fundamental issues and riddles in, in deep learning. So I'll, I'll start uh, the, the connection to, uh, to pattern recognition, connection to uh, language uh, understanding, connection to uh, quantum physics. But there are many interesting uh, uh, connections that we published over the, past, uh, over the past few years, which I'll try to uh, summarize in the next, uh, the next uh, few slides. I'll start with the type of uh, uh, network architectures. The first one is the classic uh, network ar architecture where you have an input uh, layer of uh, neurons, an output layer of uh, neurons, and in between hidden layers of neurons. And each neuron is connected to all other neurons in the preceding uh, layer. It's kind of a fully connected uh, network. That's the kind of classical uh, networks of the 80s and, 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 uh, and 90s. Then came the convolutional uh, networks, which, which uh, created a, a revolution in pattern recognition starting from 2012. All computer vision today uh, in the past uh, five years, they look very, very different in terms of performance than, than what we were used to in the 90s and in the early uh, 2000s. Um, you can now empower autonomous uh, driving. You can do uh, pattern recognition in certain narrow domains that uh, rival the uh, human perception like in uh, face recognition like in specific uh, object type of, uh, of uh, recognition. And, and these convolutional uh, net is an architecture of, uh, of a network. And uh, this particular architecture has, has, two, uh, has two riddles. One riddle is, is what is called depth uh, efficiency. What it, what, why is depth uh, important? And it, it turns out that the importance of uh, depth is, can be described as, as the following uh, property. If you have a network of a lower depth, in order to represent the same class of functions of a network of a higher depth, you need to grow exponentially large in terms of the width of the network in order to create the same, uh, the same family of uh, functions. So this is called uh, exponential uh, uh, efficiency. And, and this was uh, a riddle back uh, starting from 2015, 2016. 2016, we published our first paper in, uh, in COLT, uh, which is the Conference of uh, Learning uh, Theory, which we, we proved 
um, the result, which at, at that time was an empirical result, that shows that there is an exponential depth efficiency with convolutional uh, networks. Another uh, result has to do with inductive bias. Why, why are these convolutional networks, why is this particular connectivity pattern of uh, convolutional networks so successful for pattern recognition? So there is a, a specific inductive bias that has to do with the way the network is uh, connected and this is another paper that we published a year uh, uh, a year later. Um, then comes then comes uh, uh, the connectivity, which is called RNN, recurrent uh, networks. And when you think about the uh, recurrent networks, it's you have uh, a network from input to output, but then uh, the hidden layers are connected over time. Uh, these uh, these RNN networks are they also at, at a certain point in time were very very uh, popular and used today they are less used for for reasons I'll, I'll explain uh, later. Um, in terms of uh, natural language uh, processing, they or, or, or machine uh, translation, RNN were the were the architecture of uh, choice, and there also one can prove that depth has uh, has a uh, efficiency related to it. In terms of uh, memory, if you look at, you have a long sequence, say, of uh, characters, the network can remember long sequences if you have depth. If you don't have depth, then the size of the network needs to grow exponentially large in order to create the same, uh, uh, the same effect. Then, come, then, then comes the recent uh, architecture called the uh, self-attention uh, networks. These architectures, um, they're called the, transfor the, the transformer or uh, BERT, uh, originated from a, a Google uh, research and then you know, caught fire in the past uh, two years. These architectures are the architectures responsible for the success, the recent success of natural language uh, uh, understanding. And what's interesting about these uh, architectures is that it's fully connected on one hand, but uh, but the weights are input dependent rather than being fixed as in the past uh, architectures. And there also, there are certain uh, riddles of, of what makes them so successful. Uh, there's also depth layers uh, uh, related to these types of uh, networks. What is the role of those, uh, of those uh, uh, layers? But we know that from an em empirical standpoint, these architectures are creating a revolution in natural language uh, and understanding. It's not yet as the revolution that was in pattern recognition, but it's getting it, it's getting close. So, as I mentioned uh, before, when we're talking about the uh, convolutional nets, uh, why why deep learning and in bounded depth network replicate a deeper one? And the answer is no. It will have to grow exponentially large in order to uh, replicate it. So, this is the fundamental property of deep uh, of deep networks why depth is, uh, is so important in convolutional nets. Uh, this was uh, the first uh, result. Um, then, um, then we con continued to uh, looking at the connection with, uh, uh, with physics. Uh, there is a, uh, a, an architecture in, in quantum physics called tensor uh, networks. And it looks very, very similar to the, the, the architecture of convolutional networks that computer scientists uh, use. And there is a way to transform one architecture to, to, to the other and create a representation of, uh, of wave functions. And uh, we published in, uh, phys in PRL, Physics Review Letters, back in 2019, uh, we showed that deep continents, convolutional nets, uh, we can represent highly entangled uh, systems much more efficiently than any other previously known uh, approach, including other neural uh, networks that were used uh, at the time. And then we also um, looked at the issue of optimization, how to uh, optimize uh, large, large systems, large uh, quantum uh, systems. And uh, we published another PRL paper earlier uh, this year where we can show that we can create using techniques used in computer science, uh, a quantum sampling optimization scheme that we can uh, increase the efficiency by uh, three orders of, uh, of, uh, of magnitude. So we can, we can represent systems much, much larger than were represented uh, in the past. 
So uh, that was the connection to, uh, to physics. And uh, the last uh, point that I want to make and the, the self-attention, uh, when you look at the state of the art in convolutional nets, um, like uh, ResNet, uh, for example, you see that these networks are, they have a large number of layers, are very, very deep in the order of hundreds of, uh, of layers. If you look at the self-attention uh, networks, they are not deep. The latest one, uh, the latest network, which is a, a monster network, has, uh, has 24 uh, layers. The type of networks that, um, that were before had, uh, had merely uh, six, uh, six layers. And the question is, is whether this was just a, a coincidence that uh, these networks are not very, very deep, or there is a fundamental issue uh, going on there. So there were some uh, empirical uh, research uh, going on by, uh, by others. And what you see in this graph is a uh, test loss on, on, on a downstream uh, task. And uh, the lines, the different colors of the lines are the number of layers of this self-attention uh, uh, network. And you see that you, when you go from one layer to two layer to three layer, um, there, is, there is an impact. It means that the test loss grows lower if you add layers. But once you reach layer number six, all layers above six layers, you, you don't see any, any impact. So uh, as, as if depth at some point exhausts itself, there is an impact of depth until layer six. And from that point on, there isn't much of an impact. Uh, if you want to create more expressivity, you can also increase the width of the network. Width or depth, they make no, uh, they make no difference. So there isn't any something special about depth uh, beyond uh, layer number six. Okay, so th this is empirical study by, by Kaplan et al. Uh, early this, uh, this year. So we, we recently looked at this problem from a theoretical standpoint, trying to understand what is really uh, going on there. And, and we came up with something uh, uh, interesting. So there is a depth efficiency, it's even double exponential in terms of efficiency, but it saturates itself very, very quickly. So the theorem says that if you have a depth L1, which is smaller than some threshold depth, and that thre uh, threshold depth is log of the input dimension. Normally the input dimension is around 1000. So log of 1000 is about six. So we get this magical number six here. So as long as your depth is below this magical uh, uh, threshold, you have a double exponential um, uh, efficiency. It means that if you, have, if you take a network which has a smaller number of layers, it will have to grow doubly exponentially large in terms of the width in order to replicate in terms of expressivity, the network of depth L1. But once you are beyond that, uh, once you are beyond that threshold, width and depth contribute similarly to expressivity. There's nothing now special about uh, depth when you, want to, um, when you want to create more uh, expressivity. So depth matters, but it's so efficient that it exhausts itself very, very uh, quickly. And, and this also explains the, the empirical results and why practitioners, when, they're when they design these self-attention uh, networks, they don't go very deep. So uh, this uh, theoretical result you know, goes hand in hand with the empirical results done by, uh, by, other, by others. It, doesn't, it, it goes beyond just explaining them. It's now a tool in order to design uh, self-attention uh, networks. And uh, as I mentioned before, self-attention networks is now the, the most successful tool in unlocking natural language uh, understanding. And, and, and we in our lab believe, and, and this I think belief is shared among many practitioners in the field, that the next frontier in machine learning is language. It's not that we have solved all the problems of pattern recognition, it's not that we have solved all the problems of uh, computer vision. It's not that we have solved all the problems of machine learning. For example, unsupervised uh, learning is, is, is really an open uh, issue. Self-supervision is, is an open uh, issue. Supervised learning is very, very successful. Um, computer vision capability of today's machine learning doesn't rival human perception. It rivals human perception in narrow, in narrow domains. But still, you can, you can achieve uh, very, very impressive results and uh, a very impressive industrial 
uh, applications like uh, autonomous uh, driving with uh, a pattern recognition capability of deep networks. But the next frontier in, in language, one can create a, a, a transformation in the way we uh, understand language, in the way we generate the uh, text. One can think of, uh, of a machine that is able to understand language and generate the uh, text as, say, word processor 2.0, where we just express our ideas and the machine would write, uh, would write a document itself, or a machine that can understand academic uh, papers or understand manuscripts, make the connections and uh, suggest uh, new areas of, uh, of research. This could be a, a very, very big uh, transformation. And self-attention networks is a very, very important tool in, in, this, new, uh, in this new frontier and understanding the theoretical limitations and understanding the, the riddles of what makes it work is, is very, very important uh, in our lab. So I'll, I'll uh, stop here and I'll be happy to, um, to answer any, any question. Thank you very much, Amnon. Amnon, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Wonderful. So we have one question uh, from Emily. Uh, this is a technical question, so maybe you can explain it better than I. What are the implications of exponential networks for artificial intelligence and the development of computer based on multiple factors instead of just binary ones? Maybe you can explain it better to the audience because I don't. It's it's not my own field, so it's hard for me so to the, the, to explain. The exponential what depth efficiency. The exponential depth efficiency says is that. If you have a network of a certain depth, and now and it expresses a certain family of functions, if you now design a network with a lower depth and you want to express the same richness of, uh, of functions, you'll have to be exponentially large. And, and, and this is the true value of depth. This is why deep networks are much more successful than shallow networks. Because back in the 90s, uh, you know, one hidden layer networks were very, very uh, popular. Uh, people didn't go into depth because optimizing those networks were very, very difficult. But the theory of depth efficiency shows that you should make an effort of optimizing deep networks because depth is very, very important. It's exponentially uh, uh, important. Uh, this, this is, this is, what, this is what, what, what entails in, in depth uh, in efficiency. Okay, there is another question from Hadar. Do you believe that there is a connection <coughs> to the number of layers that you are using for your machine vision uh, to what happens in the brain in terms of depth in our visual system? Are we using deep networks, so to speak, in our visual system similar in some sense to what you are using in your autom autonomous cars or in your research? You know, the human visual system, the, the human system or the, the human brain is, is much more uh, complicated. It's not just feed forward. The type of networks that, that we are dealing with and the industry is dealing with are, are mainly feed forward uh, networks. And uh, we know that in the human brain, there are all sorts of oscillations. It goes back and, uh, back and forth. It's much more complicated. It's not as deep. I, I wouldn't say that we are talking about uh, networks with the depth of uh, 100. So it's not as deep, um, and it's it's an it's an interesting thought because when you look at the self-attention networks, you don't need to go so deep. So uh, maybe self-attention uh, networks are 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 more similar to what is going on in the brain than uh, convolutional networks. So I have a question. Yes, please. Hi. Can I can I ask you a non question? Uh, can you hear ca Chaim? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, so, Amnon, uh, can you tell us uh, li a little bit, a taste of uh, how you bridge between your theoretical machine learning research and real-life applications in Mobileye? I, I wouldn't call it a, a bridge. No, theoretical research is, uh, is very important because this is the only way to deal with fundamental uh, uh, problems. Because if you don't deal with fundamental problems, uh, you you quickly saturate and, and reach a glass ceiling. If all what you do is is implement the state of the art that exists in the industry at a particular point in time, you don't have an edge over others. In order to have an edge, you need to really 
take a step back and, and look at the fundamental, uh, look at the fundamental problems. And, and once you understand the fundamental problems, you, then you can leap. You can create architectures uh, um, because you have a deep understanding of, of what makes these uh, systems uh, work. So for, for example, in autonomous car, what we need to build is not only the perception, we need to, to build also the decision making of, of, the, of, of the car, because the car, once the car understands the, the, the surrounding, where all other road users and what are they doing and stationary objects, all, all what is necessary in order to understand the, the roadway, the car needs to make decisions to change lane, not to change lane, how to interact with other road users. It's kind of a, a multi-game uh, strategy, multi-agent uh, strategy. Uh, another thing that a, a, a car needs to uh, needs to optimize is how do you balance uh, safety and, uh, and and usefulness? Uh, there is a significant AI going all going uh, going there as well. It's not machine learning type of AI. It's more rule based uh, AI. How do you reduce the richness of decision making into a small number of uh, principles? Uh, I'll, I'll, Seems like uh, you know the Asimov uh, robotic laws, something of that uh, of that nature. So it's percep perception, decision making, and balancing uh, safety versus uh, utility that are three main uh, principles of uh, making an autonomous uh, car. But really, the, really the, the building blocks, the pillars, is is a really deep theoretical understanding of what makes architectures uh, work, what makes a specific architecture work. For example, people think about end-to-end -end networks. You can build a, a monster network that will take as an input, you know, the incoming video from cameras around the car and output the, the, the steering commands, steering and, and throttle and, and braking commands, uh, just like with language. Today, uh, language, when you think about machine translation or uh, question and answering in, in language, it's, it's a monster network that receives an input, a sequence of text, and the output is the downstream task, whether it's a question and answering or, or, or whatever. You can, you can think of something similar in, in that way, also in autonomous driving. Input coming in, which would be videos, output that, that will come out uh, would be the steering and, and throttle. And, and people kind of toy with this idea. But if you have a deep understanding of the theory, you understand from a sample complexity point of view that you will quickly reach a glass ceiling there that your, the architectures that you'll need to build will grow exponentially large in order to start meeting all those corner cases that are very rare in, in the scene. So you better build an architecture which is decomposable, that, that, that you, you, you infuse your prior knowledge of how to break down the problem into different networks rather than building one homogeneous network because there's sample complexity. And normally, Practitioners, they don't go into issues of sample complexity. They, they, it's more they have a hammer and then they try to, to use it as much as, as possible. And this is where really uh, the point of view of a theoretician comes, uh, comes to play. Once you have a, a deep understanding, you can do things that are much more clever, clever than uh, going uh, a brute force uh, with the problem. Question, of course, I could not resist no, even asking down. it myself. This is from uh, David Sikorsky from Geneva. When do you expect fully autonomous cars to reach the mainstream market? Okay. I'm known. So we are, uh, it, it's a journey. We believe that 2022, and, and we are on track for 2022 to launch a, a fleet, a robot taxi uh, fleet of around uh, 100 cars without a driver. It's a uh, it's a big task. It's not only a technological task, it's also a regulatory task. Uh, you need regulators uh, to be uh, with you, to give you license uh, to, to remove the driver. You need to convince the regulatory bodies that you know what you are doing, that you can give guarantees about the uh, probability of, of entering into a, a, an accident. Um, but all of this is, is converging towards uh, 2022. From robotaxi, it will take a number of uh, years until, until this technology would reduce its cost, would uh, have sufficient practice with regulatory uh, bodies in order to go mainstream into consumer level cars. I believe it will not happen before 2025. So it will start 2022, 
Um, it will start moving into consumer vehicles minimal 2025 and, and probably later. And uh, by 2030, maybe five to 10% of cars will be autonomous and enabled. It's a, it's a long journey. Long journey. Wonderful journey. Maybe I know that we have, you have to leave very soon, Amnon. So if it's okay with you, one last question from uh, Simon Kaflon. Uh, with those architecture that you are using, do you, are you trying to mimic the brain? Are you inspired by the brain? Or you, you look at it as a separate architecture independent of what you know or no. learned or what we learned about the brain? I can't control it. Or can you be inspired by what we learned about the brain to improve your technology? So I, I, think, I think it's very, very important to know the latest research about the brain model. Uh, whether these particular architectures, they try to mimic the brain. I don't think they try to mimic the brain, but being inspired by the, the recent research of brain modeling is very, very important. I believe at the end of the day, they will converge, but it could take uh, many more years. Yeah. Okay. I, I just wanted to, to tell everybody that what, what you call a neuron in the deep network, this neuron is, of course, simplified element, but it has this on, off, zero, one, like some, something like neurons, they do also fire or not fire. You have synapses, connections, which can change their efficacy. So it's already inspired by the neuron. There are networks, deep network, not as deep in, uh, deeper than in the brain, but there is already inspiration. And I believe myself that the inspiration will grow and maybe there will be new tricks. And as you say, recurrency and more sophisticated, sophisticated networks inspired by the brain. There is a very nice paper, recent paper in science by Shimon Ullman, who is our friend and was your supervisor at some point on, in science about what can AI learn from neuroscience. Highly recommended paper. Thank you very much, uh, Amnon, you. for being with us. Very interesting, very inspiring. Thank you very much. Hope Thank to you. meet you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, Shalom. Toda <coughs> Raba. Okay, <coughs> so we are coming now. Now we are more relaxed <coughs> because uh, we have more time. So I, I just want to introduce again, <coughs> we, are, we are talking from Jerusalem. This is the Edmund and Lilith <coughs> Safra Center for Brain Sciences, the new center in Jerusalem uh, that, that is trying this reach out to the public, to you. The brain circle <coughs> itself uh, is an idea to involve people that <coughs> love the brain, that want to know about the brain, typically, as I said, physically. And I hope <coughs> that by the end of this meeting and also the next one that we plan maybe for September, you will consider joining physically the brain circle. Uh, so I want to introduce uh, the next speaker, our colleague, friend from ELSEC and from computer science at the Hebrew University, Professor Naftali Tishbi. We call him Tali, if it's okay with you, Tali, because I can't really think of you as just Tali. So Naftali Tishbi is a professor in computer science and at ELSEC. His background is physics. He did his postdoc in MIT in physics and then shifted to be interested in the interaction between brain, physics, and especially information theory. Uh, Tali Tishbi is one of the most well-known worldwide uh, researchers in using information theory to understand the brain and also brain-like machines. Uh, I'm sure you will hear a little bit about that, but I want to say personal thing about Tali because after all we are friends of so many years. Tali is a a man of all season, you may say. Uh, he's interested in music, he's interested in language, he's interested in art, he's interested in, in, in creativity. He's doing many things, interesting things. And also I want to say that uh, he's the son of a very well-known Israeli professor in uh, Kabbalah, uh, Tali. So Tali, it's your stage, it's your platform to tell us a little bit about the AI revolution, the connection between brain and machines. Let's start, Tali. Thank you. Thank you very much, you done. It's a li little bit embarrassing. Uh, so I'm going to, to go to uh, give a very different uh, talk. I, I, I know that mo many of you are not experts in this field. And I just want to go down to, to the very basic questions of artificial intelligence, uh, especially the way that uh, we see it in, 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 in everyday life. And, uh, there's a lot of, of misconceptions, there are many misconceptions about artificial intelligence and, and a lot of fear from artificial intelligence which I want to address. So, so this is going to be a, a somewhat different uh, type of talk, very basic and very non-technical. 
So again, I, I want to talk about AI, artificial intelligence, what was the dream and, and what, was, what are really the achievements of, the, of artificial intelligence in the last few years, and, and some of the puzzles or, or questions that the success of artificial intelligence is actually uh, uh, raising. I mean, so essentially there is a, a really big, uh, big uh, debate, or big philosophical debate between uh, those kind of machines that we build that we heard from unknown about some of the technical issues there, but essentially what we build are a very simple concept of what we call sensing acting automata, which are essentially systems that sense the world, make decisions, and then act. So this is really a very primitive type of uh, concept, and the question is really how far uh, such machines, such very simple devices, uh, how far are they from life and, and from what we call general intelligence in humans? And uh, essentially, the, the, the surprising success of, of the last uh, 10, 20 years in AI is really uh, questioning the border between these two types of things uh, and, and essentially putting this question whether our brain or we are only sensing acting automata, which is really one of the, one of the most uh, fundamental assumptions of the, the center here in Jerusalem. I think we all essentially assume it, but there is a philosophical question here. Can machines really understand and, and, and where is really this boundary? Uh, and so I'm going to say a little bit about uh, what uh, this success is telling us about the brain. I, I guess that Chaim is going to say a lot more about it. And, and, and uh, I really want to, at the end of my uh, presentation, just to talk about uh, the, the fear from AI. I mean, essentially, you have to think about AI as something going to, to be with us, just like the coronavirus, at least for a while. And it's going to, to change us in the sense that we are not going to be the same afterwards. And it, but we have to think about it as, 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 as essentially extension of us and not something which is going to compete with us. And, and I think this is very important. So I just want to do a very quick uh, comparison. I mean, uh, why do we think that computers and the brains are in some sense uh, similar? And why do we believe that computers can mimic the brain and even compete with the, 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 the functions of the brain? So we know that computers are built from something we call logic gates, which are essentially just uh, uh, very basic logic elements like AND and OR and NOT and, and things like this. And we know that the brain is, is built by, from very simple, although Idan will, will, will not agree with me, elements that we call neurons, which are essentially some sort of gates. They're more complicated than AND and OR, but they're not much more complicated. They take many inputs that generate an output, which is complicated, but can be mimicked by a gate. And then we know that in computers, we are using these logic gates to do what we call logic circuits, which are essentially elements that compute things like add addition and, and multiplication and things like this, where uh, the, the elements of the brain are more what we call small neural networks. We can have thousands of neurons and essentially function like an element that computes something. And, and we know that the computer is essentially a digital, a digital element of, 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 of this. So essentially, we, we work with digits like 0, 1. It seems to be very different from the way the brain works, which is essentially a combination of analog and digital in the spikes in some sense. And, and there are other differences, uh, 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 which I just want to very briefly mention. The computer has a, a central processing unit, or CPU, and have completely separate memory units. So the memory is just like a big tape or a big, uh, a big uh, scrabble board where, where, where the computer writes. Whereas in, in the brain, we know that the memory and the computation is all done by neurons, and we can't really logically separate these things. And this seems to be a very fundamental difference. Actually, modern computers really uh, use what we call active memory. So the difference here is not as big as it seems. There's something fundamental about computers, which we call universal computing. This is an idea of, of Turing, which I'll mention in a second that essentially one computer, one computer program, the, the operating system of a computer, can, can run any other co program or any other task. So essentially, there's one element that, share, that uni unify all type of computing. And we don't know that biology is doing this. In, in biology, the, the elements are local and very specific, like you know, vision, language, hearing, and so on. And then they specialize in, in one particular task. So this idea of universal computing is, at least not, not, or not to clearly implement in biology. But then, on the other hand, the elements of, of, of the neurons can learn many different things. And of course, that's what we do in, in, in artificial intelligence as well. Computers are much 
much faster in terms of the, 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 the speed of the elements. I mean, we're talking about gigahertz, uh, uh, billion uh, operations per, per second, and they're very dense. I mean, we're talking about elements which are nano, nanometers, are very small. Whereas uh, in the brain, the, 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 the elements are, are slow. I mean, they, 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 we talk about spikes, which are about one millisecond, one, and, and, and we talk about neurons, which are about mi one micron. So they're a lot slower and a lot sparser. So this seems like a very dramatic difference, but actually it indicates something very bad that computers are very highly inefficient uh, energetically. They're much more expensive in terms of energy consumption than, than biology. And this is one of the big gaps that we still need to close. I mean, flies, for example, uh, take a, a, a tiny fraction of the energy required for anything that mimics flying uh, in, in that sense. And of course, one basic difference is that Computers are programmed by, by humans, so something is actually designing it uh, up to the last, min, uh, last bit and the last detail, where it seems that the, the brain and, and biology in general goes through evolution as some sort of self-organization over millions of years. Uh, and, and of course, there is one, one thing which Amnon already mentioned, this exponential growth. I mean, computers essentially double their power every couple of years. Uh, still do it, because uh, we get to the end of it, so they, they grow in, in, in terms of speed and, and density and efficiency and size and, and computational ability exponentially, where the, our, the biological brain, as we know it today, didn't change much in the last uh, 100,000 years, the human brain at least. So, we, so there, it's really an unfair competition because one is really exponentially, exponentially improving all the time and the brain seems to be constant. So how are these two things relate to each other? So again, very briefly, I just want to, to mention what Amnon already emphasized. I mean, without mathematical understanding of the theory, we couldn't do anything. And of course, the computers were born as a mathematical idea in the brain of Alan Turing uh, about 70 years ago or more. And, and, and the whole notion of universal computing and the fact that you can actually build a machine that will do, do a general type of computation uh, is due to Turing. And there's another element. So computation is one part of the story, and the other one is information, which is, uh, was formalized and quantified by, by Claude Shannon. And I really believe that it, it's the combination of the understanding of information and computation, which really brought us to, the, to where we are now, what we call the, the, the computation ages, and enabled the technology that we call artificial intelligence. Somehow my slides are not moving. Um, OK, that's funny. No, no, it's all right. It's just uh, those, those are the things that happened in real time. Ah. Anyway, so, so uh, I'm trying to move forward. Oh, ah, yeah, there is, a, there is, a, there is a, no, there is a box there that you need to close. Sorry. Oh, this is Apple. Close it. Yeah, thank you. So, so. Uh, yeah, so Turing uh, is the father of what we call the Turing machine, which essentially is the father of the computer today. So the dream of artificial intelligence was, was really to create machines that look like us and behave like us, which are essentially indistinguished from us. That is really the essence of, of uh, what we call the Turing test. So essentially, if we meet a, an, a, a real AI, we should not be able to distinguish it from a, a real human. And, and this dream, uh, is really what motivates the whole the whole process of AI or the, this. Uh, and now I, I'm going to do something which is uh, really very pretentious. I, I want to really define intelligence. Why do we believe that we can actually mimic intelligence by machines? So, the way I think about intelligence and many others is that essentially it, it, it boils down to one particular thing, the ability to make valuable predictions. And if you think it's not only intelligence, it's life itself. I mean, life itself is all about systems that are able to exploit past, the past observations and sensations and whatever in order to, to make valuable actions and plans in the future. So if you think about it, the, 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 the life of these two animals depends on the ability to know or predict what's going to happen in the next few seconds. And the deeper we predict both, or, and, and the deeper in the past we, we remember, uh, more intelligence will become in some sense. So in, in, that, in that picture, uh, the brain is nothing but a machine that essentially generates internal representations of the past which are valuable for the future. And in terms of, I, I actually formulate it in terms of information. I mean, how much information from the past I have to remember in order to act 
in, in a useful way in the future. If you think about it, this is a very simple concept, which we're going to call the, the perception action machine. And, and our assumption is that our brain is, is, is mostly doing that. I mean, extracting efficient, uh, efficient uh, sensations from the past and, and, and efficient representations, which allow us to make useful predictions. That's a, a fundamental concept for me, which really motivates all my research for many years now. And essentially, the question is, what, do we, what are those efficient internal representations? Now, if you think about it, uh, uh, we are just like uh, the, the, the cleaning robot at home. I mean, this is also a sensing acting machine. It's, uh, it sends the, the, the walls and the, and the dirt on the floor and so on, and then moves accordingly. So is there really a fundamental difference between this, this particular, this simple machine, like, like the cleaning robot, which, which has essentially the whole cycle. It has a memory, it has input, a sensory input, it has some control process, and then it acts. And that's, is this all we are? I mean, that's essentially the question. I mean, is there any room for something like self-awareness and consciousness? I mean, we, clearly, we can't think about the robot as having consciousness. I mean, this sounds ridiculous. But when, when you think about the extension of it, I mean, let's think about playing chess. So playing chess is, is, is much more than that. I mean, we, not, we don't just sense and act, we actually plan ahead. And this seems like a fundamentally different story, but it turns out that we now understand the mathematics of control, that planning ahead is just, just extending the memory and, and, and somehow uh, uh, make a longer and longer plan into the future. So in some sense, our, our concept of behavior in, in our center is really very much like the, the, the mice and the rats and, 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 and the humans are, are not more than a machine that somehow encapsulates the observations from the past and code them in some funny way, like, like bits, and eventually then act in, in, in a useful way. So the basic assumption of artificial intelligence is, is that sensing acting system like this can, 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 can take us essentially anywhere. And if you look at the brain itself, it's really, largely speaking, divided into the sensory part, which is responsible for the perceptual memory of vision, of, of hearing, of sound, of, of motion, and so on. And then the acting part, of the, which is the frontal cortex, more or less, which is responsible for short-term reactions, like moving my hands now, or planning this, this talk, or, or, or thinking about the long-term future. And again, so, so in some sense, the brain looks like a sensing acting machine. And the question is really the fundamental question, I think, of AI is how far we can take this. Where is really the boundary? So where is the boundary between uh, machines, auto automata like this, and, and things that we call under understanding? And of course, when AI started in the 50s, there were many hopes, and then there were many failures. And if you look at the literature of the 60s and 70s, you're going to see many, many pictures like this, because AI was built on the, on the very simplified or simple assumption that you can ask an expert how do you do things, he will explain it to you and you'll program it. This is what we call expert system. But th such machines which were actually built in the 60s and 70s never really worked for hard problems like pattern recognition or vision or language understanding, mainly because what we now call lack of generalization. They were essentially a table, what we call a lookup table. I mean, in this state, do this, in this state, do this, and so on. But there was no generalization beyond the, the, the particular experience and examples that the machine saw. So we, we understood this more or less in the, in the 70s, or in, in, the, in the 80s, that something fundamentally is missing. We need this ability to generalize. But there was also a very fundamental criticism of AI, which I think that the, the, more, the more sophisticated version of it is due to P Roger Penrose in his uh, very famous book, The Emperor's New Mind, where essentially he said, no, Artificial intelligence can never be really intelligent because understanding, I mean, in the sense of, let's say, mathematical understanding of a theorem, or understanding of anything requires more than this sensing acting machine. A machine like this, an automaton like this, which is this, this fundamental concept of Turing, I mean, something which has memory, has actions and sensing, can never do understanding. Well, what Penrose actually argued is understanding requires what we call self-awareness. You cannot really understand without, without uh, being able to and this requires consciousness, and consciousness is, is not computable in the sense that a machine cannot have consciousness. And, and, and Penrose pushed push, push the, the answer to quantum mechanics, which is very speculative. So where, where is really this boundary? And I know that I'm more or less out of time. I just want to, to, tell, to show you that in, indeed the, 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 the old AI 
even robotics was really a joke in the sense that we couldn't really control simple things like standing, walking, moving, and in the very, actually, we were much better in sophisticated things like playing chess than in doing basic, basic uh, control. And, uh, and uh, I think that the change, the conceptual change between the old AI and, 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 and something, something that something really happens here is happened in 1997 where IBM uh, computer Blue, Blue Brain, which was essentially a, look up, a big lookup table of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, Positions on on the board of chess of, of both board states uh, into into actions and this very specialized machine managed to uh, play chess at the level of uh, of uh, world champion of Garry Kasparov, but the real revolution happens and I'm not already mentioned it and uh, in the introduction of neural networks Chaim will also elaborate on this which essentially these many layers of uh, neuron-like, or uh, these caricatures of neurons, which are just this logic gates in many, many layers. And this suddenly, in the, uh, about, about 15 uh, years ago, started to change the game completely, because all the problems that we could not solve in the 60s and 70s, like identifying uh, dogs from cats or whatever, were suddenly solved by this particular architecture. And this raises a, a lot of interesting questions, even philosophical questions. Uh, essentially, deep learning really made AI a real thing and something which really affects our life. And, and, and I'm just very briefly going to, it affects vision, it affects language understanding, it affects uh, a, a control, it, a, it affected the computational biology, drug design, and of course what uh, Amnon already mentioned, natural language processing, understanding language. And again, understanding language was considered one of those things for which we need consciousness. But here are machines which are nothing but those uh, sensing acting automaton, and they still, uh, and they manage eventually, I mean, really one of the landmarks in, in AI is another game, the, 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 the Go game, which was considered really very hard, and experts in AI and, and experts in, in game theory thought that this is never going to happen, uh, and at least not, not in our lifetime, but this particular deep learning, by essentially networks to play against itself, against each other, uh, manage eventually to reach the level of, uh, of the world championship in, in Go. Okay, I know that I have to finish. Uh, the question I want to pose here is really, the, where is really this boundary between understanding and, and just doing sensing acting? And is the success of AI really telling us that you know, driving cars, uh, operating, in opera uh, operating robots in, in, in surgery, or, or, or you know, creativity, I mean, can we actually uh, allow those machines to be creative, like showing them a picture of Van Gogh and, and, the, and the photograph of Stanford, and then asking them to, to asking in some sense about using this, uh, this uh, deep learning version uh, to, to paint uh, Stanford as Van Gogh. I mean, is this creativity, is this really breaking this boundary that we always thought is unique to us humans? And there are many, many examples like this. And so I, I'm going to, to skip all our contribution to this. I mean, we have partic our particular way of understanding how deep learning works by essentially focusing on the important and ignore the irrelevant. So it's one particular aspect that we know how to formulate mathematically, and I think it's a very fundamental aspect, how to ignore the irrelevant details of the, of the problem. And this is what eventually, in my opinion, caused uh, the success of these things. I'm not going to get into it much more than that. I just want to, to mention the fact that we are working on, on, on these fundamental issues of understanding AI and, and understanding how, how deep learning works. In, in, in a very uh, a concrete and, uh, I hope, very uh, successful way, way as well. I mean, you already have heard from Amnon a lot of successes. I just want to summarize by, by raising a few points. I mean, so, so what do we learn from success of AI? First of all, it's possible to, to build machines, know every bit of it, and not understand how they fully work. I mean, this is a very strange thing. I mean, if you ask Idan, he'll tell you that if you can simulate something, you understand. You have to understand. So it's not really true. I mean, we can build something and not understand how it works. The connection, collection of, it also shows us, this something which was not clear at all, that the collection of many simple elements, which are essentially just doing this very simple gate, special gates, can essentially perform very complex uh, cognitive tasks like understanding language, like playing chess at the, at the expert level, or, or, or driving autonomous cars. How the, so there's some transition here from very simple elements. This is a proof of concept that simple elements can do it, and maybe the way we think about the brain is, 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 is correct in that sense. And while the similarity to the brain is still superficial, uh, 
I, I, I mean, similarity between deep learning and AI is still superficial. Uh, it challenges uh, the view that our brain is more than an automaton. And again, I think challenges, uh, let's say, Penrose and other things, other people, many people who think that we have more than just sensing and acting uh, systems. And uh, I just want to emphasize the fact that AI is going to stay with us and enhance and improve humanity, not replace it. So don't, don't worry about it. It's, it's, it's just like, you know, we, we don't think about glasses as something which uh, is not natural. Uh, glasses improve our optical deficiency. AI will improve some of our intelligent deficiencies, and maybe it will make us much more equal. I mean, so not being intelligent will not be uh, such a bad thing as it is today. Maybe. Anyway, it's here to stay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tali. <laughs> There are many questions to be open now. I don't think we, we should open the discussion now because we'll, well, let's go to the next one and then we shall have a discussion. But there is one question, just one question, because we need intermission between you and our next speaker. So David Sikorsky asks, how do we define, how do you define self-awareness? When, when will you know that a machine has a self-awareness? No, so so one, the one of the questions is that maybe we, we don't really need it. I mean, so in some sense, uh, AI is pushing the boundary. And, and what is self-awareness, what is consciousness, what is uh, intuition, I mean, there are many, many things. Emotions. That, <laughs> uh, emotions. And so, it, unless, uh, and we uh, attribute to these machines self-awareness at some point, so it's some sort of a collective behavior that emerged from, from these very simple elements, and, and, def and therefore they have self-awareness because they behave as if they have self-awareness. So my definition is, is Turing definition. It's, it's just, he told us the simulation of intelligence is intelligence, and I think that simulation of self-awareness is self-awareness, but <laughs> we have to deal with it. Yes. Okay, we'll have a discussion. Thank you very much, Tali. We'll, we'll continue it. By the end, we shall have a discussion among all of us. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Many of you know Chaim already uh, from the audience, that the hundred, more than 100 people that listen to us now, but still. Uh, Chaim uh, is a physicist, a solid-state physicist, a physicist studied in Bar-Ilan, uh, Bar then in Harvard as a postdoc, then in Bar-Ilan, and in now in Jerusalem for many years. He is actually one of the founders, the fathers of, uh, of ELSEC. It was, uh, at some point, it, it was called the Interdisciplinary Center for Neural Computation, the ICNC. That's where I met Chaim, and we became very close friends. So one, this is one advantage mm -hmm. of having uh, people like Chaim near you and Tali. Uh, Chaim is, uh, is actually one of the main physicists who brought physics into brain research and established a field that is called a computational neuroscience or neurophysics, uh, which, is which is very powerful, a field connecting what we know about the brain to machines, as you hear today. Chaim actually studies many aspects of the brain. You won't hear it today, but Chaim studies vision, uh, motor control and movement, memory in brain and machines. Chaim knows a lot. He's interested in, uh, in, uh, in free will. He's interested in ethics. And he gave many talks in ELSEC and also in, in the Brain Circle about these controversial aspects, interesting aspects uh, between religion and the brain. Uh, but today Chaim will speak about something very specific, mm -hmm. deep learning in brain and machines. Chaim. Thank you very much, Idan. Uh, good evening, everybody. <coughs> so I'm going to uh, continue the theme that already was uh, uh, established by uh, Amnon uh, and, uh, and, and Naftali Tishbi. Um, I'm going to focus on deep learning, uh, already mentioned here, uh, and the connection between deep learning and artificial networks in machines and the brains. And one of my primary goals uh, in this uh, brief presentation is to try to convince you uh, that uh, the connection uh, between uh, deep learning in, in the brain and in machines uh, can be pushed beyond, beyond uh, just uh, a metaphor or inspiration. Uh, so uh, let me just start from uh, uh, the brief uh, history, recent history. Uh, as already mentioned uh, by Amnon and Tali, uh, the breakthrough uh, in AI uh, uh, was marked in uh, 2012 uh, by uh, a big uh, competition in machine vision, 
uh, ImageNet competition. ImageNet is a database which is very interesting and very useful uh, in vision. Uh, it uh, consists uh, about a million images uh, uh, organized in about 1400 categories like cat, dog, mug, hat, and so on. Uh, and uh, the algorithms uh, were supposed to uh, be able to take an image and to classify it as a cat or a dog or, or, or hat uh, and so on. Uh, and this competition has been going on for several years. Uh, and in 2012, it was uh, the first, uh, the first uh, breakthrough in, in, uh, in performance uh, in which uh, uh, a deep network, a deep in, uh, with eight layers, uh, uh, did uh, uh, reduce very substantially the error uh, of that uh, these uh, algorithms uh, are doing. And since then, uh, the performance uh, uh, became better and better as networks became deeper, like 19 or 22 or hundreds uh, uh, long uh, networks. Uh, the errors uh, went down, and, and finally the errors are even smaller than uh, the human performance on this task. So this was this is amazing success uh, of uh, deep uh, deep networks, and this actually uh, uh, ushered in a whole new uh, area in uh, in machine learning, machine vision, and AI, as already mentioned here. Uh, so these are uh, examples of the networks that. Uh, were uh, built to perform such uh, such feat. Uh, the original network was eight layers, AlexNet, then longer networks, and then finally the modern networks at the bottom uh, can go up to 100 even more uh, uh, deep networks. So let me first say wh what what is deep learning. So deep learning has two um, main ingredients. One is the learning aspect to it, of it, and what we mean by learning is that the, there is an algorithm that teach networks uh, new computation to acquire new tasks to, to perform new computations, uh, and they do it uh, by uh, changing incrementally the network connections, uh, and that the, those changes in connections uh, are done by repeated presentations of many examples. So as you see in the bottom, you sh you you, uh, you you present an image for instance, uh, uh, to a network, uh, and you have an output uh, which is supposed to classify you to detect the, the face or the person uh, in this image, and if the network is doing an error, like in this example, then the algorithm modifies slightly all the connections in the network, and this is done millions and millions of times, you repeat it by different images until the error uh, a, a actually goes uh, essentially to zero. Uh, so this is what, what learning uh, is doing in deep networks. And finally, uh, the neural networks, the architecture, as already mentioned, is deep. So there is multi-layer architecture, as, as shown here. Uh, and most important uh, aspect, in my view, of depth is the ability of the network to successively learn new and more complex features as you go from one layer to another. And let me give you uh, a, an example of that. So uh, you see here uh, an example of uh, networks uh, uh, that, uh, that has been trained uh, to perform well on object recognition tasks. And you can see that uh, which, uh, uh, each, uh, what, what, what are the most uh, a successful part of the image that uh, excites a neuron in, in which layer. So in, in layer one, each little square here is uh, one neuron, and what is the patch in the image that this neuron likes, that it, exc it excites mostly this neuron. And you see that there are mostly edges, and some of them are colors, very low-level features. If you look at layer two, you already see uh, uh, other features like textures and like curvatures. And if you go to higher and higher levels, layers, you see that uh, the features that, the, that neurons in these layers like are, are, are very complex, are parts of an image, parts of a face, uh, part of, uh, uh, of a structure, and so on and so forth. So the ability to, of networks to learn to extract complex features uh, as you go uh, from one layer to another, until you go to the top uh, layer of that networks and you get a very efficient representation of what's important uh, in, uh, in images or in, in general in stimuli. And the, the important uh, aspect of that is that you don't 
hand design those features that you let the network to discover what are the important features uh, 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 through learning. Okay, so uh, deep learning is in general inspired by the brain for many reasons. The building blocks are neurons or units that we call neurons and connections that we call weights, uh, but they are, they are at least uh, metaphors of real neurons and synapses in the brain. The architectures are similar to some extent of hierarchies of brain sensory systems. Learning mimics the learning of animals and humans that are uh, incrementally uh, acquire skill through experience. Attention is uh, the fact that we uh, represent stimuli, we understand stimuli in, 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 their, in their context. Creativity, uh, that networks are able not only to react to, uh, to stimuli, but also to, uh, to be generative, to, uh, to imagine, to change, uh, uh, change images uh, uh, in, in artistic fashion, and so on and so forth. And compositionality, which already was uh, mentioned also by, by Amnon, the, the ability to generate more complex systems by taking simple basic modules and combine them in interesting ways. So all these are features that are, are inspired by, by the brain and by, uh, by human and animal cognition. I would like to actually focus here briefly on attention uh, and actually elaborate on, uh, on the theme that uh, Amnon mentioned, uh, that attention uh, really led to a breakthrough in the ability of deep networks to process an, uh, a language. Uh, so what is attention? I'd like to just give you a little bit of explanation of what is uh, remarkable by attention. Uh, and uh, this is, this, uh, you can see it by this example. So if you want to process, to, to translate, to understand the sentence like the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired versus the animal didn't cross the street because it was too wide. So it's clear that you cannot, on, the, on one hand side, the machine has to process one uh, word at a time to translate or to uh, understand it. But on the other hand, it cl it's clear that the words have meaning which depends on the context. So a machine that uses attention uh, is able to discover that it in the first sentence is attended by, uh, uh, by, the, uh, by the street uh, uh, by the animal, sorry, uh, and the street, versus in the second uh, uh, st case, the same word it uh, is strongly attended by the street because it corresponds to the street in the, in the second sentence and it corresponds to, uh, to the animal in the first sentence. And again, those attention influences or, or the context of the entire sentence, how it influences the interpretation and understanding of individual words in the sentence is not hand designed because this is too complex and we don't really have a set of rules uh, that we can actually apply efficiently uh, in machines. But through learning, uh, the, with the attention modules that, that Amnon mentioned, uh, machines discover those relations and can uh, use them very efficiently uh, in language processing. And you can see it also in the combination of language and, uh, and, and vision. If you build a machine with attention, it's capable very efficiently to uh, interpret or, uh, 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 scenes. Uh, for instance, in this case, uh, as you see here, the frisbee uh, is generating an attentional searchlight on the spot of a patch of image which has this, uh, the, 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 the frisbee and here the dog. Then you see here the attentional searchlight which is attending uh, when uh, the word dog appears in the sentence uh, to the particular uh, part of the image uh, which contains a dog. And this is very reminiscent of the uh, idea of attention as a searchlight which takes a complex uh, a, a stimula, stimulus and at any given time attends to the relevant part of it which, which is well known from uh, cognitive and systems neuroscience. So here is I want to give you, uh, to show you an example of today's, uh, today's ability uh, of language processing. So this is an interview uh, by The Economist uh, 
uh, with an expert uh, f uh, about predictions for what happens in 2020. So the question was, which technologies are worth teaching in 2020? And the answer is, I would say, it is how to narrow down the list. The most important artificial intelligence, which is becoming exponentially more powerful. And so on and so forth. There is no time. You can read it yourself. Do you have any other predictions in 2020? The last question was. And the answer was, I'm not a futurist, but I do think there will be significant political change. I think there will be major changes in EU, particularly with the British leave, etc., etc. Now, the, the funny thing is that this interview was uh, conducted between an editor in The Economist and the a state of the art uh, uh, language processing uh, deep uh, network machine. So uh, uh, you can, I, I think it's very remarkable to see how the machine uh, understood the question uh, and was able to generate a rather intelligent and reasonable uh, uh, answers uh, to, uh, in, in, such a, in such an interview. Now, this doesn't mean that we solve all problems uh, about language uh, in machines. Uh, there are, uh, there are uh, again, hurdles and challenges. And here are examples uh, uh, showing that uh, machine translation is still uh, not perfect. So here you have, please do not uh, feed the, uh, the flamingos in this. Uh, here you see for, bed, for, for restrooms, uh, go behind or go back. Uh, uh, go, uh, to, uh, uh, go, go back, uh, uh, forward you behind, or uh, carpet eating, or eating carpet uh, strictly prohibited. So these are uh, very funny examples of uh, fl failures of machine translation. So this is not perfect, uh, of course, but there is a huge breakthrough uh, by the uh, combination of deep learning uh, and uh, the insight that uh, in language and in uh, many other applications, but particularly in language, it is very important that the machine takes an item, in this case a word, uh, and uh, process it not in isolation, but in, uh, in its attention field or in the co correlation or context uh, of this word uh, across the text, across the sentence. And this is done through learning uh, and uh, let machine discover the relevant attention of each one of those, uh, of those elements. Uh, so, uh, deep problems for deep learning. So, the, despite the hype in, in deep learning, uh, there are, of course, uh, serious problems and uh, they are well known. Uh, some of the machines are sensitive to attacks. Uh, they are still not general enough to mimic artificial, to mimic general intelligence uh, in humans. Uh, it, artificial general intelligence is still um, ahead of us. Um, more art than science, uh, we, we don't really have a good uh, scientific understanding, or, or at least it's very limited. We are only at the beginning of that. Uh, and finally, there is a common uh, complaint that uh, uh, that the machines, uh, in order to learn to perform their task, requires deep learning requires too many training examples. And I want to spend one minute about the last point because I think there is here uh, uh, a more subtle aspect uh, to that uh, to that problem. So, from the technological perspective, of course, it's very costly to have all these images or all these texts uh, and other stimuli. Uh, that are needed to, to train uh, to train the machines, but from the perspective of uh, of the brain or of human cognition, uh, one can uh, look at it uh, a little bit different. And uh, here I want to pose the question: Can deep networks uh, learn new concepts from just a few examples? So the point is that the network may uh, actually need to have many many examples in order to generate a good understanding of the general domain. But after they reached it, they may be able to expand their domain of knowledge by just a few examples. So in order to test this, we, uh, Ben uh, and the Surya from Stanford, our colleagues, uh, we uh, asked the following question. We, we did the following test. We, we uh, took a, a deep network that trained 
on an image uh, on, on image net uh, cl uh, training classes so the, this uh, network is very successful in doing the classical uh, t uh, uh, test but now we took uh, uh, images from held out classes. So those classes, the network have never seen, never seen anything which looks like a windmill or looks like uh, a, a pizza uh, or, 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 or cement mixer and so on. And we asked what happens if we take this machine after training and we try to, uh, to uh, see uh, how many examples the machine will need in order to learn new concepts. So uh, here is an example. So here are two, uh, we, we present the, the network with two images, uh, just examples from, from uh, two categories that the machine have never seen, has never seen neither the images nor the categories. And we ask the, the machine to tell us whether the, the top image uh, belongs to category at the left or category at the right. Uh, and, uh, and the machine is doing, uh, we, we can do very well uh, in this task and the machine can also do uh, surprisingly very well on this task. So you can see at the left that the accuracy of the machine to perform such, uh, such a, a classification or basically learning the new concept barn owl versus uh, uh, barred owl uh, uh, just from uh, one example uh, 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 one example per category uh, is amazing. So if you do it from feature layer, from the top layer, you use the network, you get 97% accuracy. If you try to do it just based on the images without using the deep network, it's completely chance, it's 50% uh, uh, performance. Uh, and here is another example. Again, you show the, the, the network just two images at the bottom and you ask if the third image belongs to this or belong to that and again the performance is 99% uh, if you use the deep network, the trained deep network versus if you use the images which is almost like chance. So our conclusion is that in, it, it is true that you need m a lot of experience, many examples in order to build a network that understands vision in general but once you have it the network is capable like humans, uh, to learn new concepts from just a few examples. Finally, I want uh, to go back to the point where I began and ask, can uh, we use deep networks as models of brain information processing, namely, not only say deep networks are inspired by the brain, but also uh, uh, use deep networks as models of brain information processing and do it on a qualitative basis, not only just on metaphors. And here I, I, I want to give you an example. So it's already mentioned here, well, well known, that in vision we have a hierarchy of visual areas uh, from low level to a uh, higher level, which is called IT or IT cortex, uh, which is uh, similar to some extent of uh, deep networks in, uh, in the vision domain. Uh, uh, specific parts, some, there are some patches in IT cortex. This was discovered by our colleagues, the Tsao and Freiwald, uh, several years ago, uh, that in this uh, uh, hierarchy there are patches which are marked here, which are in the macaque brain, in the human brain, which are specialized for face processing. And you see, here as you see an example of uh, uh, two, uh, three cells which, uh, which respond only to faces but not to other objects. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, Uri Cohen and uh, So Yung Chang and Dan Lee, uh, uh, our old uh, uh, friend and colleague and collaborator, we, we, uh, we asked uh, the following question. We took the images that the, uh, uh, that the IT cortex was presented uh, through the animal vision uh, and we took all these neurons and we estimated how much information about face identity the IT cortex in those face patches had. And uh, I wouldn't go into what the numbers mean, but the horizontal line uh, marks the, um, estim our estimate of the IT cortex ability uh, to provide information about face identity. And then we took the same images and propagated through a deep network that is trained for face identity, and this is this uh, uh, curve, upper curve here, and was surprised to find that at the top layers of these networks, we found exactly the same 
information capacity as the IT cortex. And this is not simply a generic network, because if you take a network which is trained for objects, not faces, you find a, a, a lower, uh, lower capacity. So this is just an example of our research and research in many groups uh, around the world that uh, are attempt to use deep networks not only as inspiration either from the brain or from deep networks to, uh, 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 back to the brain, uh, but also to use them as a, a quantitative models of cognition and also of neural processing uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, learning. So finally, let me just tell you that this field of deep learning, AI, and the brain is one of our vision uh, for the future of LSEC. Uh, we have started a, a, a small center for deep learning and the brain and the, the main goals of that center is first of all to uh, elucidate the science of uh, deep learning and AI, uh, secondly to develop applications which are uh, specific to, uh, to brain data, either brain data analysis either in the lab or in the clinics, uh, to uh, use uh, uh, AI uh, uh, models, as I described, to uh, new, uh, uh, new models for neuroscience, for, for understanding the brain, to develop novel algorithms uh, brain-inspired for AI, and find, finally to promote collaborations with industry. We, are, uh, we, are, we have uh, excellent resources because in addition to LSEC, we have fantastic computer science uh, uh, department, we have uh, groups of physicists that are interested in the field, we have connections to two medical centers, uh, Hadassah and Shari Tzedek, we have, uh, we have uh, very close uh, international collaborations, uh, and we have, uh, we have uh, 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 collaborations with, with industry, uh, and, and therefore uh, we are very hopeful that uh, LSEC will be able to be at the front for, uh, a forefront of uh, breakthrough in both uh, artificial and human intelligence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chaim. Wonderful. I'm learning a lot myself. Um, so, so we have a few questions. I will leave some to the end, but I want to, to ask a, a question that is actually a repeating question in, in some sense about fear, about worries. Uh, this is actually for the two of you, both Chaim and Tali. And so, so David, David Sikorsky asked, do, do we believe that AI will be used or already is used first to understand neuroscience, to help us understand the brain rather than the opposite, so to speak? <coughs> so, so, so use, use machine learning to understand <coughs> our system. And also, <laughs> David asked, are your jobs at risk on the long term? So the machine will replace us. This is the part of the fear and we won't have things to do because the machine will do it instead of us and maybe better. Hi. So the, the first question, uh, I, I think I, uh, I just emphasize again what I, what I said. Uh, we, we, be, we believe that, uh, that deep learning uh, is giving us a, a, a fundamentally new tools for the study of the brain. I gave, uh, I gave a very small uh, and, and tiny uh, anecdote, anecdotal example of that. Uh, but uh, think about those deep networks in some sense as species. Uh, and, and, uh, and we can do experiments with them that we cannot do uh, with animals or with human brain. Uh, and, uh, and, and therefore, uh, we and, uh, and, and our colleagues, at least some of our colleagues, believe that there is, a, a, there is a, an enormous potential of using deep networks uh, to as, as predictions, as models of what to expect uh, t uh, from, uh, from the brain and to guide new experiments to test those predictions and, uh, and, uh, and, and maybe suggest uh, modif modifications of the deep, uh, the deep networks. Uh, and, and so to, to build a fruitful cycle mm -hmm. of research, uh, experimenting, experimenting and theorizing in brain science and in AI. So I just want to add to, to the second part of the question. So, uh, <coughs> of course, it's, it's up to us. I mean, this is, these are just tools that we are building 
in some sense, they are extensions of other machines. I mean, humans have been living with uh, additions to themselves. I mean, ever since we started to use uh, clothing, and you know, so I gave the examples of the, the glasses, for example. Nobody is going to say that having glasses is going to change us, or it's not fair in some sense. It's improving us. In some sense, I, th I see the artificial intelligence as, a, as, a, as an additional extension which is going to improve us, not compete with us. And, and it's in, we're going to find those specialized things that we are good at, but you know, adding, uh, you know, some people are, have difficulties reading, some people have difficulties writing, some people have difficulty uh, generating things. I mean, and, and those machines can give all of us uh, suddenly uh, the abilities to be faster and more intelligent. And I think that this inequalities that we have today between more, more intelligence and less intelligence people and to some extent is going to be reduced, it's going to make us a much more uh, democratic society mm -hmm. in some sense. Uh, that's what my belief. And, and uh, it's definitely not going to replace us. It's, I never see it. I see it as a tool that I can use. We're using Google all the time. Yes. We're using computers all the time. We don't see it as something that takes But But I think, I think, Tali, that the fear comes, you are not afraid from your glasses. People are not afraid from glasses or, uh, you know, eyeglasses. People are not afraid of something that replaced the limb with, because they don't see this as themselves. But when you start, so to speak, to think about your brain being replaced, you know, your, your special capability as a, as a brain to learn, maybe to feel, then apparently from Frankenstein time, and even before in the Bible, there is this fear of a machine, the machine that will look like us, will do things like us. And when I say us, I mean my brain, not my limb, not my heart, if you replace my heart, but my brain. I think the fear probably comes, I mean, there is a fear, so we have to relate to it. And I agree with you that, that, that they could be colleagues, this AI could be our colleagues, no, extension, part of, us, part of us. But apparently there is a fear, and you know, you see questions like that <coughs> and other, whenever we meet, you say, ah, you're going to replace me and so on. So we have a scientist that work on this field, we have to relate to it in, in a sense, we can first understand why the fear comes. But we can discuss it at the end. There is one question from Dan Lee, who is going to, to speak immediately after the question. So Danny asked, there is something very special about uh, the brain because we can have a one-shot learning. You know, there is a trauma. Let's say I have a car accident and I don't need repetition. I not mean many examples. Me and the animal too will remember it forever. This is a one-shot learning example. So is there something special about the brain or could machine do one-shot learning as well? I'm just yeah. giving an example of essentially one-shot so, so learning. So this is not my question, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, I would like to, uh, to address the example uh, that Dan mentioned, uh, like, um, uh, like traumatic events. I think this is not, this is n not, not something uh, magic. I think uh, all animals have those uh, instincts built into them. They learn uh, that something is, uh, is toxic or something is dangerous by, by one, uh, by one, uh, one uh, experience. And I don't think there is a problem in, in, in building machines that do that. I, I, this is not the problem. I think the problem of, one, of future learning is more when you try to learn n new categories, to generalize from one example. If you don't generalize, then it's very simple. And the example that I brought was precisely uh, attempting to show that I machines also, once you give them a general knowledge about a field, they can learn new concepts. They mm -hmm. can generalize from one or two examples. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I'm, I'm very optimistic that with progress in the field, we'll find that deep networks uh, can do uh, general, can generalize from a few examples and can do few-shot learning or one-shot learning uh, 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 as, as humans and animals. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Chaim. Okay, so let's go to our last speaker, Dan Lee. You already hear Professor Daniel Lee. Uh, Dan, 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 we call him Dan. He's a colleague, as Chaim mentioned. He works with Chaim for many years. So Dan Lee did his BA in physics at Harvard and then his PhD in, in condensed metaphysics in MIT. Uh, he is presently at uh, the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department in Cornell Tech and also a Vice President at Samsung Research. Uh, Dan Lee is a world-renowned uh, expert in autom autonomous uh, uh, machines and especially in robotics, as you will hear soon. Uh, he is now in the East Coast in America. 
Thank you very much for joining us, Dan. Uh, he's a friend of all of us, uh, so welcome, although far away due to the corona, but we feel close to you. It's your turn now, Dan. You are the last speaker. Great. Thank you, Idan. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I can hear you. And can you hear me and see this, my screen? Yes. Um, so, yeah, thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, I had an opportunity to spend part of my sabbatical um, at Hebrew University a number of years ago, and it was a, you know, one of the greatest times in my life to be able to work with Haim, talk to Idan and Tali and the rest of the faculty at LSAC. And I think it's a, you know, it's a wonderful program, and I hope you continue to support it to the fullest extent because it allows folks like myself to have an opportunity to learn from the experts there as well. Um, so what I want to do tonight, and I know it's getting late, is to tell you a little bit about some of my research and you know, some overview of what are some of the problems, the research questions in robot intelligence. And um, similar to what Tali was mentioning, my motivation is to really try to understand the similarities between you know, what we study in machine learning and AI and what biological brains do. And really, I think the fundamental question is there, are we missing something as scientists, right? Is there a secret sauce in the brain somewhere that we haven't discovered that is limiting you know, our ability to make machines as intelligent or as kind of smart as humans? And I think that's really the central question here. And, and you can study it from a biological point of view, or you can study from an engineering point of view. And I hope someday that we will be able to merge those two points of view sometime in the near future. So one way of doing this kind of comparison, and this is kind of um, one technique that people have been studying, is to quantitatively compare human performance versus machine performance in, say, a competition. And so we've seen, you know, uh, different kinds of games being done this way. So, you know, we now know that uh, games such as chess, trivia contests, such as Jeopardy, the game of Go now have all been solved by machines, right? Now, if you are playing any of these games and you play against, you know, a computer, you essentially have no chance of winning as a human being, right? And this is kind of why, why I think there's been a lot of excitement in AI is that, oh, whether we are getting to superhuman levels of performance across the board, especially given this kind of evidence. However, let's talk about robots, right? And as uh, Idan mentioned, all the, you know, this has been a dream maybe a nightmare all the way since, you know, uh, early literature, like the legends of the golems, right? We have this dream or, you know, vision that we can build machines that can kind of perform things like us and can kind of replace human beings to a certain extent. Um, how many, of you, I hope some of you are science fiction at aficionados. Um, you can, you know, if you recognize some of these robots, it is great. These days, the students in my class can only recognize one or two of these, whereas I think some of the older folks here can hopefully recognize Data from Star Trek, HAL from 2001, which is now should be a historical movie, not a science fiction movie. And of course, Gort is, is from the day they were stood still. And these are all the similar, you know, motifs that, you know, humans are able to build machines that kind of have all these uh, uh, abilities to think and reason, just like we do. But where are they now? So, you know, where are these robots? You know, given that we can build machines that can play Go, that can play chess, why don't we have a robot that does your dishes for you, right? Why don't we have a robot that picks up your, you know, the, the toys after your kids throw them on the floor, right? Where are they, okay? And what's limiting us from creating these machines? All right, so the reason why it's different to make a robot is that they have to actually interact in what we would call the messy physical world right, as opposed to a virtual game environment, all right? Or, you know, when what's the difference between the physical world and a virtual world? Well, in the physical world, you have so much more uncertainty. The dynamics are uncertain, right? You have things like friction. You have so many more continuous, high-dimensional, continuous parameters. Whereas in a game, you have limited, you know, places you can move. You have a discrete space in terms of the number of actions, the number of states you can have. The real world really has all these uncertainties and it can be what we call non-stationary, right? You could have something that learns to do something in the summertime, but here on the East Coast, that will fail if you go outside during the wintertime, right? The, the outdoor conditions are completely different and these machines can't handle that kind of um, changes in, in terms of the uh, domains and, and being able to deal with all this kind of new data. Right? And that's really, I think, one of the critical issues is we still, our AI and our machine learning is not good enough to handle this level of uncertainty and dynamics and kind of uh, uh, other uh, adversarial agents and those kinds of issues, all right? 
And the way we try to do this, right, is what uh, Tali mentioned in his uh, presentation, is that we have a nice paradigm where we try to mimic human intelligence by breaking down the robotic problem into what we would call sensing, planning, and then action, right? We want to first take in information from our sensors, vision, smell, touch, and try to then uh, take that perception and try to then use that information to build what we call a world model, our understanding of how the world's going to, what the state of the world is, and uh, predicting what the state of the world will be at, at, say, a future time. And then once we have the state of the world, we then try to make decisions or plans accordingly to try to maximize some sort of uh, utility function. And then once we have a plan, we have to execute those plans. So then we have to you know, deal with motor control and being able to actually act on those plans. And once we try to put all those things together, then we can build an autonomous system, an agent that acts according to like how you know, we model ourselves. And so this is how you would actually build something, say like an autonomous vehicle um, that Amnon talked about, right? You're taking perceptual information from your cameras, from your IMU, from your different sensors. You build up a representation of the world in terms of the other vehicles, other people walk, pedestrians, bicyclists. You then map them out in some sort of two or three dimensional space. You then try to come up with some set of behaviors. Should you pass? Should you let the person go ahead of you? You then have a plan in terms of how you should, you know, veer to the left or veer to the right. You then uh, generate a trajectory. You then send that trajectory to your motor controllers on your vehicle to be able to steer, to hit the gas pedal and so on, right? And this is kind of how we engineer these systems today. But the dream now is can we make these systems learn to do a task in the physical world like we do, right? We have sensors, we have our actuators, and we're just going to learn like the brain learns as this kind of mess of neurons that will basically take this information in and generate the appropriate actions out and try to remember what's important about the world and try to keep track of the predictions of what's going to happen in the world. And so this is kind of the, you know, uh, I think the, the big vision in terms of deep learning is that we could try to learn this just automatically. All right. And the way we kind of formalize this is something we, we call a Markov decision process. It's really that, you know, we have our robot or we have our agent, and it really takes in information from the environment through its sensors to estimate a state. It then takes an action, and then the environment changes, right? That's something we model as a transition probably. And then the environment also provides rewards to the agent. And what we then try to do then is essentially a form of reward maximization. Right, so if the environment is giving us a reward at the current time, it may be a reward, you know, tomorrow, and the reward in next, the day after tomorrow. What we try to do is kind of what the economist model in terms of human behavior is that we are trying to maximize some sum of rewards over time, and there's something called the discount factor, which is kind of basically interest rate that says that a reward next year is worth a little less than a reward immediately. And what we then try to do is we try to come up with a policy. That is, how do we act according to the current state? What action should we take so that we maximize something known as a value function? That is kind of an estimate of how much reward we will get over time. All right, and that's really how um, these systems are built, essentially engineered to try to optimize this function, this re total reward function. And this learning rate, I mean, this uh, discount rate is very important because it kind of explains the difference between how kids act and how adults act, right? Kids, if you say that they have a choice between a cookie right now and 10 cookies, you know, an hour, if they wait, they'll take, tend to take the cookie now, right? They're kind of maximizing kind of myopically the immediate reward. Whereas, you know, as you get older, you learn how to kind of plan for the future. You're able to kind of think about rewards, uh, long-term rewards as opposed to short-term rewards. All right. And this is kind of the idea of reinforcement learning is that can we train our robots to learn just like like animals do if you kind of give them rewards over time. All right. So kind of the standard example of this is Pavlod's dog. Right. That what they do, the dog has learned to associate this kind of food reward with the state of a bell ringing. And it's able to kind of learn that through several examples. And then it's able to understand that the bell ringing is a state that will indicate some future reward give, to given to it. And you know, there's experts at LSAC that work on this kind of biological reinforcement learning. They concentrate on something known as a dopaminergic system in the brain, that whose function it is is to predict, in some sense, the error in terms of the value functions that we use to try to do this task. All right. And then, you know, what is kind of the goal of reinforcement learning? One goal would be to learn some sort of motor coordination skill, right? Being able to do things with our muscles so that we can actually perform some actions over time. 
All right. And for, so, for example, um, if we do this, try to do this in robotics, the same idea. If we want to do motor coordination, we use a bunch of motors instead of using a bunch of muscles, but the, it's the same idea. Right? Motors are basically a, a collection of magnets, permanent magnets, electromagnets. By modulating the current, the electrical current in these motors, you can control exactly on a servo motor the angle of the output shaft of the motor. Now what we have to then do is if we want a robot to be able to actually do some interesting tasks like locomotion, we have to then figure out the sequence, the precise sequence of activations to send to each of the individual motors so that the robots can do a, this kind of task. So here's an example of a robot dog that we had to try to train to learn how to walk. So in this case, you see that this robot dog's able to walk forward, walk backwards, you know, walk, turn around, walk to the side. These are all different precise temporal sequences of the motors being activated. And for instance, in more complicated tasks. So in this case, this dog has been trained to essentially do a flip. And then from this position, be able to actually do a crab walk that is walk back and forth on its back. And then from this position, it can actually be trained so that it can actually do a, a roll, right? Roll left, roll right on the other direction. And these are all very complicated sequence of motor activations that have to be essentially learned over time so that it actually executes the desired physical, um, you know, uh, role or, or, or movement. All right, and that's kind of the idea. I mean, the, the process that we are able to do this so, you know, over time to learn that, can we actually do this on our robots? And so an example then is now we go from four-legged robots to something more like ourselves, bipedal humanoid robots. So now when we talk about locomotion, this is an amazingly complicated physics problem, right? When we're walking with two legs, every time we take a step, we're basically balancing on one point, right? Either the left foot or the right foot. And what, that's essentially something known in physics as an inverted pendulum. It's a pendulum that's completely unstable. And what we have to then do is we have to control all our muscles to be able to walk in a precise fashion and not fall over. And so what we then have to do with our robots to learn this is incredible. We have to train it to essentially learn these physics models, be able to control the accelerations of the different angles, and also then solve some of these almost very complicated trigonometric equations to be able to kind of keep itself balanced. And so if you do this from a model-based point of view, you can get these robots to walk and do certain skills. So this is an example of some of my students. They put together these robots. Dan, sorry across. for yes. Go ahead. The movie sound from the movie. We could not hear what you explain. Can you can you rep okay. can you repeat it? You know, no, mute, the sound. Oh, okay, mute the, sound the sound from okay. the sound. Yeah, you know, over over overpowered you. Yeah, we could not hear you. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I just was explaining that. You know, if you really want to have a precise control to be able to walk and shoot, and these are all the things that you know, as you know, when we learn to play a skill, a sport like this, we can do automatically. But you know, these things have to get be programmed into these robots very precisely, and it has to do with understanding the physics of this problem, all the trigonometric uh, transfer. This is something very complicated that we do very naturally. And this, I think, is a mystery, is to try to get these robots to do that. Now, one thing that I just showed you in that movie is that, you know, we can make a model of walking, but that's only good if there's no external perturbation. So you saw that when the robots got pushed, they fell over. So the idea is how do we deal with that, right? How do, how do we actually handle things that maybe aren't so predictable? And so, you know, we have these strategies for locomotion where we can basically, you know, respond to external perturbations in different ways. One way is using our ankles. Another way is actually using hip rotations to do angular momentum. And another way is actually generating new steps to capture our momentum as we're falling in a certain direction. And so one way of doing this, uh, one idea then is to take these ideas, try to build them into our robots. So this is reinforcement learning for robot locomotion. 
And what this little robot here is being trained by basically being pushed around on a sled to be able to um, learn to respond to these perturbations in the same way humans do, right? Being able to use uh, their, their vestibular sense, learning when they're about to fall, and then basically generating kind of motions that basically compensate for these falls. And this is, you know, obviously very important for bipedal locomotion because it enables, you know, these robots to hopefully be able to get to where they're supposed to go if they're walking around in a complicated environment. Okay, so this is an example of a simple kind of trying to use reinforcement learning for locomotion. And now the, um, I think the excitement in AI is can we expand this? Can we use reinforcement learning in combination with things like deep neural networks that Hyman and Holly were talking about? Um, and be able to train our robots to be able to, you know, now not only just walk or stay upright, but to do our dishes or to, you know, pick up the toys or to fold the laundry, all these tasks that are kind of what we would like them to be able to do to help out, say, in the household. The problem here is um, the sample complexity issue. That is, the number of training examples that these robots need to learn is humongous. Hundred, you know, these reinforcement learning techniques take hundreds of millions of examples. And if you try to show a robot hundred million examples, the batteries and the motors will be broken long before they've even gotten to any part of the training. And so what they're trying to do is trying to do this in computer simulation first and then transfer them to the robots. But the, again, the issue is the messy physical world that we can't simulate the physical world well enough on a computer so that when we train it on a computer, it doesn't transfer over to actually working on a real robot. And that's really the issue is why we're stuck with this problem. And this is why we don't have the robots that do all these fancy things. So let me give you an example of a robot that um, kind of problem that we still are really, really far away from human performance, all right? So this is a robot that um, is trying to manipulate a drill. So here now, it sees a drill, it has to pick it up, it has to then generate the trajectory, the motor control of its arm, the seven degrees of freedom in the arm, it has to you know, open and close the gripper in the right way, it has to pick it up, it has to kind of point the drill in the right direction, it then has to turn around and kind of you know, move and say, try to put a, a hole in the wall somewhere. These are very, very complicated uh, skills to try to have these robots learn. And this is real-time performance. You see my you know, students are very careful about how this robot moves. And so this is the state of the art in terms of robot manipulation, okay? Let me compare that with human manipulation, okay? So this is actually a competition that they have for kids. I, I, I don't know if it's worldwide, but at least in the US they have it. This is a, the 12 year old national champion at cup stacking. And these kids have learned how to stack cups up and down, up and down in a certain pattern, very you know, precisely and very quickly. So this is, you know, the, the real-time video. So this boy has learned to do this cup stacking and you see kind of five, six seconds, basically as, as stacked and, and de-stacked a bunch of cups, you know, in, in no time flat. And this is still orders of magnitude better than any robot that we have. Any state-of-the-art robot that we have built would be do would you know could, would slowly put one cup at a time would drop cups if you change you know the cups so that they're slightly more slippery they would start to drop the cups if you change you know the shape a little bit they would have to adapt to that it wouldn't be as robust I mean these are all the issues that we have in robots today and so in terms of AI we still haven't completely figured out how to make these systems deal with the kind of messy physical world as well as biological systems have done. And I think that still is a challenge problem for us, you know, uh, both from an engineering point of view and also from understanding brains of how we are able to deal with those situations. Okay, and as uh, Tali mentioned, you know, there's lots and lots of robot failures and this is why you don't have these robots in the home. Okay, it's, it's still that they're not robust enough they're too expensive, and they're basically not going to work in most cases. They'll drop things, they'll fall over, all those kinds of things. So that's all I wanted to say today, and just to emphasize that, you know, we still are a long ways away in terms of robotic performance. You know, how to get these systems to reason about what we would call large, high-dimensional, continuous state and action spaces, incorporating uncertainty, incorporating non-stationarity, um, you know, what's the uh, role of data-driven approaches versus model-based approaches to solving these problems? And I think this shows you that there is a, a strong need for new fundamental insights. And I think that these will be uh, gathered only through kind of good collaborations between neuroscientists, engineering folks, 
and theorists like the folks at the uh, at LSAC have. So thank you very much, and I hope uh, you have some questions. <laughs> thank you very much, Dan. Fascinating. I was actually hoping to see robots and people dancing together, you know, because I love dance, and, but, but I see that there is a long way until the robot will be able to perform these smooth movements that is so easy for us, you know, the hand goes here and so on. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a long way, apparently, but I guess you can learn a lot from the human body. How do we do it? It's true that for a child it takes, I don't know, a year to stand and walk, so there is a process of a long learning. Other animals do it faster, like chimpanzees, but apparently you can learn quite a lot from the human, both the physics of the muscles and bones, but also the nervous system controlling it. So you will have uh, this kind of robots. I guess you are doing some kind of interaction. So, so I don't, I, we, we don't have actually many questions until, until now, so we can discuss it a little bit among ourselves. I'm sure maybe Tali wants to ask you, or I can ask Tali and so on. Hopefully, People will, will join in, uh, but please feel free, all of you, the, f the 60, 70 people that stay with us, please ask questions. I will try to follow the chats. Uh, in the meantime, Dan has to replace the connection with us, so we shall stay the three of us, Tali, Chaim, and myself for a while. Dan will go out and will come back again uh, to discuss a little bit between us, the future of AI, what is missing, what did we learn until now, what is the excitement. So let's start, and then, uh, and then let's see if you have, we have something from, from, uh, from you. So, Adar Levi Aharoni, I guess you are in Israel, Hadar, or maybe not. She's a student. She's st our student. Yeah. Oh, she's, our she's student. a student. Ah, I don't know. I don't know. Do the more complex tasks, e.g. washing dishes, require a more generalized or a more complex reward? Is that a question for Dan specifically? Or? Yeah, I guess so. But uh, again, so I, I may want sooner. to add to this. Uh, I mean, it seems that uh, okay, natural language, as as Amnon said, is is really the natural next frontier. And actually, we're making big progress there. I think it seems that robotics is still missing some fundamental aspects. We don't know how to mimic, uh, you know, flies or, 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 or you know, very simple insects. Even we can't compete with them in terms of efficiency and, and complexity. So I wonder. Okay, we can actually identify this gap. I mean, where is it? What mm -hmm. are we missing in robotics? Mm -hmm. And this is a question for Don, I suppose. Don, he, he, will, come, he, he will come soon. The, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, you are? Oh, yep. I, I, I can hear. Oh, now we can see you. Yeah. Okay. So I don't, know, I don't know if you heard this particular question while you were switching. So maybe I repeat. This is from a student of Has at Hadar. Do the more complex task is the washing dishes? dishes which is a complex task, apparently more than just walking, require a more generalized or more complex reward? Um, yeah, it's a good question. It's, it's, there is a dirty secret in reinforcement learning, which is something called re reward shaping, where the human designer essentially shapes the rewards to try to make it easier for the agent to learn. So they'll say something, it's almost like a curriculum, right? They, if you're going to learn how to di wash dish, first learn how to hold a dish. You get a little reward for that. Then the second step, maybe learn how to put the soap on. So you get a little bit more reward for that. Um, and so they kind of almost decompose the task into the different parts that you can learn how to you know, do at, at one step at a time. And that's called reward shaping. And reinforcement learning is used all the time to get these systems to work. Can, now, can, can, presumably, can I ask, uh, Dan, before you continue, I think we are using this reinforcement learning a lot, but I'm not sure that the audience know what we mean by saying uh, reinforcement learning. Can, can you say a word? or? One of you just, well, just as an example. Explain, explain it. it. Yeah. Yeah, can, no, but, but sure. more yeah, specific. Just a, yeah. So, so, the, so what you've heard a lot about is supervised learning, where basically you say, given this condition, do this particular thing or, or classify something like a picture. So supervised learning would be like, you sh if you're trying to wash a dish, you should move your arm exactly in this manner. Whereas reinforcement learning says, try something, and if you do it right, if, you, if you're able to pick up the dish, you get a, a plus one reward, and if you drop the dish, you get a minus one reward, but we don't tell you exactly how to move to pick up the dish. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the difference between supervised learning and reinforcement learning. 
but it's a very it's a much more difficult in some sense problem because you have to then infer exactly what to do to get these rewards and so this kind of complicated tasks are usually decomposed into simpler tasks by the reward function um, and that's that's really some human engineering is still involved with that and of course we would love to be able to take that out that that you could just kind of do minimal kind of rewards and just say just like uh, you know, uh, to your kids, finish the dishes, and I'll give you an allowance if you finish the dishes. That's the type of reward that we would like to be able to use. Mm -hmm. So human, human, you think that human are using mostly, you know, as a child first, I guess you get some reward of what, what you are doing. There is a supervisor, your parent, let's say, or your teacher, gives you some reward or tells you what to do because he or she knows it already. But with time, you develop this kind of independency of being able to learn on your own. Is that something that happens to to a robot? You you get you get. Well, we we as as human designers, we yeah, we are much more like parents of one year olds than parents of eighteen year olds as roboticists, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We we treat them very mm -hmm. much with kid gloves, and we try to teach them every little thing because we they can't learn just completely on their own, mm -hmm. and that's the that's the issue. Yeah, this was another question that I had in my mind. This this kind of many examples that you use. Typically, you use many examples to teach these this deep networks. I was wondering how many examples do a child see? What kind of order of number of examples do a child see until, until he, you know, he recognizes the face of the mother or the mm -hmm. father? What is the order of magnitude? Do you see many million of examples? I mean, the mother in this angle, this angle, this angle, moving above. What well, the, yes, I mean, yeah, there are millions during of one year of experience with your mother, you actually see millions of I mean, different millions poses of and phases, yes? Uh -huh. I, I, think, I think there are, there are basic functions that are, uh, are hardwired in our brain. Uh, and I, I think, uh, for instance, recognizing the mother is, is essentially from day zero. Well, to some extent. To, yeah. some, to some extent. <laughs> so, 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 yes, but... but uh, you don't have to show it million examples. No, but you know, I, I don't know how much but you see in, in the first day. I mean, your vision uh, okay. is not. Ah, but once, I mean the once so it smells. Yeah. Uh, so, the, okay. so the, uh, the baby smells, uh, and and uh, and then when it sees, when he hears, uh, this is very quickly. And but 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 I think also in the context of dance uh, lecture, in terms of robotics, I think much of our basic motor skills us and animals, I think is, is hardwired. And evolution has plenty of time for millions of millions of examples. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so I think it is kind of unfair, because now in machines that we start from scratch, from scratch, we have to really to mimic not the, 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 the learning of a child, but actually the, the whole evolutionary process. And we don't know how to hard, hardwire it into the, into well, the machine. Well, it's, it's some it's sort of learning, but learning in evolutionary yeah, time. But I mean, build the machine a priori with this connection, so to speak, hardwired that, that's into what it, we, that it already knows if we want before to learning. Exactly. If we want to skip that evolutionary process, then we need to actually understand exactly. the, the, the program that are right. built in, in right. into our system. Right, right. Tali, but I want to come back to you because you are also myself in some sense, but I'm no, a little skeptical. You know, I thought that, anyway, I don't want to talk about myself, but I was asking because you and also maybe Chaim are a complete reductionist. You really believe that at some point there will be a machine that we build. It will learn, it will behave, it will experience, but from another material, not biology, some other replacement, I don't know what. And, and in some sense, it will be us in any aspect. You don't think that there is some additional, as many people do feel, that there must be something more than just well, material. Well, we don't really know, but, but I think but that the experiment of AI mm -hmm. is certainly ignoring the biological details uh, that you care very much about. And, and, and we show that you know, these very basic yeah. elements, uh, computational elements, uh, eventually uh, do, what, or do very complex cognitive tasks, which means that really the details of biology are not that important. So that's a, that's a challenge to biology. But yeah. this top-down approach, I mean, let's start from the behavior and see if we can actually mimic it with very simple collections of simple elements. I think that AI shows that to some extent uh, it, it's possible. Yeah. It's challenging the, the, the importance of the biological details, I agree. No, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not thinking about biological details, but the principle, whether we will be able to build a machine that will feel, that will, will, will be conscious, 
Is there any reason to believe that we will not be able? Uh, I don't speak about the level of details that you need to put inside. Or is it something that is inherent? I mean, many people are now representing, not myself, yeah? I'm trying to represent the people on the street, so to speak. I feel there is something unique that you cannot replicate from by material. There is a feeling there must be something more. We have to discuss it. You know, it's an experiment. It's yeah, an ongoing yeah. experiment. But I want to hear what you feel about this. Free will I can, and other I can summarize thousands of years of debate. Debate, debate. <laughs> by, 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 by three, three uh, schools. One school which I think maybe, maybe all of us subscribe to, or at least tentatively, uh, that uh, that all cognition and and behavior uh, of humans are, are can be reduced to physics and chemistry, to properties of uh, of, of nature in general. Mm -hmm. That you call it reductionist. We can argue about physicist, nature, physicist. but that's I would say uh, materialism or physicalism. Physicalism. There is another school. Again, very, uh, very, uh, 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 very long tradition, dualist, that says no, that we have soul or spirit or whatever, which is different from matter. So mind and matter are, are very different things. And maybe we are unique in that sense. So machines will never have spirits or mind and so on. And then there is another, a third view that says, no, everything is, we are part of nature. So there isn't something that in us, which is not in nature. And therefore, nature has also mind and consciousness. So that is panpsychism. Pan Panpsychism pan Panpsychism pan 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 claims that we are indeed part of nature, and therefore, since we have minds and consciousness, and therefore, every part of the natural world has a little bit of yes. a mind, a little bit of consciousness. <laughs> we just have a full-blown consciousness, but also the mouse here on the table has some reduced amount of consciousness. Yes. <laughs> this is a summary of, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, of uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years I of agree. debate. And debate still goes on. But as I agree with Tali, as we advance, this is, this is an empirical question, as we advance, in technology and in science and in our understanding, and we see we, we are able to build more machines, more complex behaviors and cognition, and we are able to understand better the mechanisms working in, in, in the brain. Uh, we are conquering more and more uh, uh, domains that in the past were thought to belong strictly to, to the mind. And uh, I think uh, we will see how far we can uh, yes. push uh, this scientific approach. Yes. Uh, I, I want to add something which I, I think uh, Amnon also mentioned briefly. So uh, in, in the fact that we, we, not on, we don't only build it, we analyze it mathematically, and we actually get, get very close to, in my, in my opinion, to understanding the limits, the fundamental limits of, of uh, intelligence and, and intelligence behavior, what is the minimum requirement on the complexity of the machine, what is the minimum requirement of the predictability of the environment, mm -hmm. and so on. This is actually coming back to the kind of thing that I'm trying to do. I mean, is there really a, what you call an information theoretic limit to... And, and th this is actually very encouraging because maybe we can actually put some substantial bounds on what life can be, what intelligent machine can be, and, and measure how far are we from that. And, that, I think, is, is, is a very in interesting theoretical challenge mm -hmm. that biologists should be interested in, but it's not in biology. I just, I don't maybe know we should also, though, yes. oops, just, just wanted to comment that maybe we should also mention the, the notion of what's called general AI and for the audience that, that the types of things that we've been talking about, statistical machine learning, is kind of correlations, it's kind of locally in terms of input-output relationships, but being able to kind of think much more higher level symbolically and having that kind of representations, I think, is still unsolved to a certain extent in terms of machine learning today. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Tali or I'm No, no, I, I completely I agree. I think that robotics is really showing us how far we are from <laughs> exactly. where we want to be. <laughs> this was the feeling. Yeah. So, so the, may I ask Dan? Yeah, please. Dan, so uh, you, you very eloquently uh, explained to us the, the, the state of the art and the challenges. But do you have any vision of what would be the breakthrough 
in the future in, in, in building autonomous systems. What, what is needed? More neuroscience or, or a breakthrough in technology or better algorithms? How do you view the, the progress? So, yes, yeah, so, um, I think for me, a big challenge problem right now that I have in my research is like robotic <laughs> manipulation, right? Controlling all these degrees of freedom and taking into account uncertain dynamics, friction, you know, that the cup, the wine glass you're trying to pick up is a little wet and therefore how do you compensate for that so you don't either break it or, or drop it. I mean, these are the things that if you look at our models of this are super complicated, right? How did model friction, how to model all the kinematics, the dynamics. And we try to invert that and solve that using optimization solvers. And it seems just so cumbersome to try to do this. And somehow, you know, animals and babies, you know, kids can do this almost very quickly. And I think that still is, you know, if it's, if it's kind of genetic, is there something in the neural kind of uh, architecture that encodes this in a, in, a, in a better way than we can do currently? To me, that is still an amazingly deep problem. So, so one way will be to better understand animal and human motor systems. I, I think that would be a great achievement is to, is to really elucidate, you know, how we can do these really complex manipulation tasks so quickly and the planning involved, the controls involved is incredible. So I, 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 want, to, I want to end it by, because it's already 10 in Israel and I know people want to go to eat in London and in Geneva. But there is one question that I, I thought will come, and it's coming for you, I think, Chaim. Do you think that consciousness is an emergent property or a component which will have to be engineered? A question. I, 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 uh, first of all, I don't know. And I think the definition of what is consciousness is still a, a matter of debate. Uh, nevertheless, I, uh, my intuition is that consciousness is an emergent property of uh, the complex uh, physical and chemical and biological processes that are uh, ongoing uh, in our brain. Uh, and, and in that sense, uh, in my view, there is no a matter of principle uh, reason to object to the idea that machines that uh, once they reach sufficient uh, level of, uh, of degree of complexity uh, to the extent that they build by learning, by discovering, they build self-representation, they build a representation of their own as part of the world, uh, then, uh, then those machines will have consciousness, will have self-awareness, uh, maybe not not very different from us. Thank you very much. Okay, last question from Francois Mier, who is a member of the Brain Circle. Can you accept, we, the scientists, in your research, machines that make mistakes and that you don't understand why do they make mistakes or can you explain the mistake they make? Turing mentioned that if machines cannot do something wrong, they cannot be intelligent. Well, let me try to, first of all, I mean, I wanted to talk about it, I didn't get to it. So the whole question of, uh, uh, first of all, those machines make a lot of mistakes today. I mean, the more complex they become, the less we understand why they do what they do. And one of the, one of the challenges actually in AI today is what we call explainable AI. I mean, to actually understand why uh, this machine decided something, it turns out to be a very difficult problem. I, I'm not sure there is actually a fundamental answer to this one. So they are already at the level of, uh, Mistakes of humans are even more, uh, more complicated mistakes. So in, in that sense, uh, that's easy. I mean, mistakes are done by machines. Now, why? I mean, what? Uh, so it's not only that they make mistakes because the training data was wrong, because the, 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 the prior architecture was wrong, or whatever. There are many, many possible reasons. But they, they develop something which we can associate with human intuition even. I mean, they, they, they do things which nothing in the details of the machine make tell us why they did it. Mm. I mean, they, it's, not, it's not reduced to you know, a mathematical theorem at the end. Mm. And that's something we have to cope with. I mean, those, those complex machines really behave like humans, at least in the sense of mistakes. But there's really a big challenge of trying to understand. I mean, those machines are now doing critical mm -hmm. things. They're now driving cars, exactly. making a surgery, I mean, exactly. deciding, deciding on policies, exactly. finding targets for the army, whatever. <laughs> we need to understand why. 
they make actually, mistakes. The, this, the need to actually explain AI is a very important challenge. That was the question. Yeah. That was the question. Yes, yeah, so I, I, indeed, I, I, for, for, the sh uh, for, for lack of time, in my examples of learning from, from two images, just to, to, to learn two concepts. This is amazing. Uh, yes, but, but there are examples which I had to, I had to, uh, <laughs> to cut from my presentation, that the machines make mistakes which humans will never make. Like, for instance, that, uh, I don't know, a pizza versus a bird, the machine confuses them on, on the basis of, uh, again, on the basis of, of one of a few examples. Yeah. So this is an example of a mistake that we don't understand. But again, as Tali said, the challenge is, is, is to actually go back and deep down look into the machine and understand why the machine did these mistakes. And I think this is, this is an ongoing process of learning and research. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we make tremendous pro progress, not only by studying the success of the machines, but also by studying their mistakes and the reasons for their mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah, well, wonderful. Yeah, we can learn from mistakes similarly right. than from successes. It's not. Thank you for this question, uh, Francois. Okay. I think it's time to separate. Uh, thank you very much for coming this time and previous time. It was an adventure for us too. You know, we are not used to this kind of sitting in a studio and talking to you from all over the world. It's an experience, a corona experience, we can say. <laughs> Something new, but we shall make use of it in the future. We are in exciting times uh, also from this machine learning. I think it's not anymore something that we will say, ah, it didn't succeed. It does succeed. We are doing amazing progress. I think it's a, almost a revolution, probably not, not, not smaller than the industrial revolution or information theoretical revolution. We are in a very special time. So thank you very much for coming, joining us in the Brain Circle. Thank you for all of you, Dan in America and Tali and Amnon is not here, but thank also you. thank Amnon. Yeah. You can all open your, uh, <laughs> unmute yourself and uh, clap us <laughs> if you want for, for the effort that we did. Thank you, all of you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Dan. Thank, thank you, you, Dan, and thank, thank you, you, Tali. Yeah. Thank you. And, and we, shall, we shall be in touch again. I think probably in, the, in September we'll try to do maybe something for the kids a special brain circle for the kids. I volunteered to, to, tell, to tell the kids about the brain. We'll see what happens. In the meantime, have a great summer. For those of you who can leave the country, go to, I don't know, the Greek islands. Uh, otherwise, we'll meet soon. Thank you very much, all of you. Shalom. Toda Thank Abba. you. Thank Thanks you very much. Thank you. Toda Abba. Shalom. Toda Abba. Toda Abba. Toda Francois. Toda Nili. Toda David. Toda Viviana. To that, to that, to all of you, whoever I can see. Yeah, thank you very much. Shalom, shalom, everybody. You can unmute and, and talk to us for a second before we separate, if you want. Uh, yeah, you can open the. You can also open the video, so I can see Muriel and Picard and Jean Claude and Nili and Sophie and Emmanuel. Ah, good to see you, Emmanuel. Shalom. Good man. Shalom. Shalom, shalom. Shalom from Belgium. I guess you are in Belgium now. Oh, my parents. Ah, but, ah Ken. Ah, wow. welcome. And Wendy and Andrea. Oh, here you, here we see. Very good to have you here. Thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure. Shalom. Thank you. Pleasure for us. Thank you. Bye-bye.